Hello and welcome to another Healthy Bite. My name is Dr. Ron Early. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Well, this week I had the pleasure of talking to uh, one of the great thinkers of our time and author also of two wonderful books, uh, Jeremy Lent. And those two books are The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search of for Meaning, and uh, then went on to write the more recent uh, the released book, The Web of Meaning, Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the universe. And it's an interesting, well, the patterning instinct is an absolute tome. Uh, It covers our journey from hunter-gatherer times. It talks about uh, our connection with nature during that journey and then how things changed with the agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution, of course, as everyone knows, was born out of the most stable environmental conditions for the last 500,000 years. And that's a sobering thought and one I think we should be hearing more often. You know, we hear about climate change being, oh, the climate has always changed. Yes, it has. But the question is, how did Homo sapiens, who genetically hadn't changed all that much in the last two or 300,000 years, what happened 10,000 years ago that allowed us to start the agricultural revolution? And the thing that allowed us to and and has since that time is the most stable environmental conditions for the last 500,000 years have occurred in the last 10,000 years. So, yes, environmental changes have always gone on, but what's allowed us to develop as a species, as a civilization, is a stable environment. And uh, that stable environment has been challenged, as we know, through fires and through rising temperatures and rising sea levels. And considering the vast majority of cities have been built on the sea during this um, very stable climatic conditions, if the ice caps melted, as they have in the past, then sea levels will rise. And uh, I just had the pleasure of uh, walking in the Northern Territory in the Lara Pinta Trail, and uh, it was very sobering to learn that the centre of Australia was once uh, covered by sea and um, the ocean. And to think of that, you would have to wonder, well, if there's a finite amount of water on this planet, Where did that water come from? And one can only imagine the social disruption that will occur if there was a rise of one, two, three, four, five or 10 metres, let alone 50 or 100 metres, which has happened before in human history. So um, it's an interesting story to track our journey from hunter-gatherer, where we were connected with nature, where our... um, structures, social structures were very um, flat, democratic. It wasn't a hierarchical structure. I mean, if anything, apparently if anyone tried to rise above the the hunter-gatherer group, they were soon, soon put in their place. But then along came the agricultural revolution. And of course, one could argue was, did we domesticate plants and animals or did they domesticate us? because it made us then slaves to uh, the climate. I mean, if there wasn't enough rain, if uh, if there was too much heat, then our crops would either succeed or fail. And, of course, as we produced more food, we the population increased, and as the population increased, we needed to produce more food. And instead of enabling and, and living within nature and being connected to it, we started our... 10,000 year journey in dominating nature. And it's interesting to uh, follow what Jeremy is talking about in this cultural history of humanity's search for meaning. Um, And he draws on something that a previous guest, Charlie Massey, uh, discussed too, and that was the great acceleration and particularly from the industrial revolution in the 1700s, in the the mid 18. 18th century, from about 1750 onwards, this great acceleration, which saw an explosion of um, population. I mean, 
people were moving from the land into big cities. And of course, that move created all sorts of challenges in terms of health challenges, um, also in terms of inequality, exploitation, and, and uh, but particularly in the last, uh, well, what have we got? 250 odd years, but in particularly in the last 50 years, the great acceleration occurred from about post-war, um, from about 1950 onwards. And the growth has been exponential. I mean, I think at the beginning of the 20th century, the population was something like one and a half or two billion people. By the end of the 20th century, that was up to seven billion. And here we are 22 years into the 21st century and we are fast approaching eight billion people. GDP went through the roof. It's almost like everything we hear uh, about our health of our society is put in terms of GDP and uh, continuous growth in a finite planet is something which we seriously need to consider whether that is actually sustainable. Other things, urban populations have gone through the roof. Energy use has gone through the roof. Fertilization, fertilizer use, uh, water use, uh, the construction of large dams, communication, particularly telecommunication over the last 20 years. International tourism has gone through the roof. So the last 40 or 50 years of uh, what we could say is uh, neoliberalism, uh, let the markets dictate, has been in a period of exponential growth, which is referred to as the Great Acceleration. And that has come at a huge cost. Half of all marine life has been lost in the last 40 years. Rainforests are disappearing at an incredible rate. Uh, insect populations um, uh, are in decline. Bees, which are important for our, for literally our plant uh, development and growth, have gone through a huge decline. 68% decline in animal populations worldwide in the last 40 or 50 years. The whole, uh, yes, this great acceleration has come at a huge cost. I mean, 5 billion people, by some estimations, are going to be facing water shortages by 2050. Um, we're talking about this period as being the sixth great extinction. So since the emergence of life, uh, complex life, some 500 million years ago, there have been five great extinctions, the last one being the meteor that landed in the Mexican Gulf, which 65 million years ago, which wiped out the dinosaurs and saw the emergence of mammals as the dominant species. And we are now going through what is referred to as the Anthropocene period, uh, the sixth great extinction of species. Coral reefs we're seeing disappearing and... Um, 95% of Earth's land degrading by 2050. And this is why on the podcast, I've also been focused on uh, regenerative agriculture because doing things sustainably is just not good enough. We actually need to be focused on regeneration and rethinking. And it's interesting to compare um, Jeremy, Jeremy Lent's message uh, about... Uh, our, our journey through these hunter-gatherer, agricultural, te um, scientific revolution, and more recently in the technological revolution of the last 20 or 30 years, and to see how sustainable that is. And I actually think regeneration is the word we need to be focusing on. And that's why I, I find championing regenerative agriculture such an important part of this holistic message that the Unstressed podcast is all about. Jeremy then went on to write another, well, interestingly, still sticking with the patterning instinct, he drew on a very interesting um, uh, comparison, cultural comparison, and that was the, um, the, the journey of two great explorers, uh, one being, um, and this is all about cultural history shaping our human journey and our search for meaning. And interestingly, there was an admiral in China called Heng, Heng Zi, Z-H-E-N-G, Heng Zi, H-E. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. And of course, we all know the other great explorer, Christopher Columbus. And he draws these two comparisons 
of these two explorers as an example of the effect that cultural history has on our human journey. Now, uh, Heng Ji uh, set sail in 1405 and did uh, uh, from China, and um, it was an incredible um, uh, armada. He took 27,000 men in over five, 300 ships, and the, there were different classes of ships. There were troop and horse ships, tra horse transports, there were patrol boats, there were men of war, and there were freshwater tankers. And he did seven voyages over 28 years, and they were incredible journeys. They, they went uh, from, obviously, from China through um, Indonesia, what we now know as Indonesia, into Southeast Asia, into the uh, Sri Lanka and the Maldives, into the African uh, Peninsula, through, um, through the, um, the Horn of Africa. And they were basically the, the journeys that he undertook between 15, 1405 and 1433. So you can imagine when 27,000 uh, people or on 300 ships, and some of them were so huge, these ships, arrived at places they would have been viewed as just local communities would never have seen anything like it. And it was interesting to see what this Admiral Heng did when he reached those those um, places because what he did was he actually formed trading alliances and brought back people from those outposts and set them up as sort of ambassadors within China to set up trading routes between these people. So it was it was an opportunity for them to totally overpower the local um, population. But he chose that's not, that wasn't within the Chinese Confucius kind of philosophy of yin and yang and respect for nature and a sort of a more holistic view of the cosmos and of the world. They took back people as ambassadors and set up trading posts to those areas. Now, interestingly, what happened in China at that time, because the resources that went into building this kind of a fleet was huge and not without its controversy in China at the time. And I believe in around 1428 or 1430, a fire, um, a, a storm set fire to the Forbidden City and a lot of it was burnt down. And, and one story goes that this was taken as a bad omen for this rather huge undertaking to open up China to the rest of the world. And what happened was they took it as a bad omen and they shut down these kind of voyages and they really shut down the whole of um, China and retreated inland and China, and China was really closed off from the rest of the world until the 1800s and the opium wars that emerged from there. But it was interesting to see in the 15th century the effect that this cultural history of Confucius philosophy and this enormously well-resourced fleet um, emerging and how they took ambassadors back to China and, and wanted to set up trading posts. And they contrast, and Jeremy contrasts that with Columbus, who in 1492 set off from, from Spain with 90 men, three really ordinary boats, one of the famous Santa Maria, uh, the rudder of one of these three boats broke after three days at sea. And it's sobering to know that uh, that boat, Santa Maria, would have been absolutely dwarfed by Admiral Heng's uh, biggest boat. I mean, by some estimations, 10 of Columbus's boats could have fitted into one of Admiral Heng's boats. And it's interesting to note that why yet, yet Columbus's um, voyage in this ramshackled three tiny boats changed the entire world. And why didn't Admiral Heng? And he goes into it in, in the, um, in the book. And basically, you know, we look at the, the whole emergence of this Christian, uh, white European 
supreme view of the world and its subjugation of cultures as they moved into South America and Africa and the subjugation of uh, cultures, which was a totally different experience to um, to the Confucius model. So this is all about the cultural history and it also dovetails into the scientific revolution, which really had its roots back in Plato and Aristotle's time of this dualism, this separation between mind and body. And in my own book, I reference the work of Descartes, who who uh, is really, if you wanted to look at the origins of modern medicine, uh, Descartes is a really interesting character, a philosopher, a mathematician in, 17, in the 1700s, in the 17th century in Europe. And he made the point that uh, in order to understand the human body, it needed to be broken down into its individual parts, which, you know, at that time when we didn't know much about how the heart worked, how the lungs worked, how the nervous system worked, there was a case for that. Um, so breaking things down into their smallest part was a very important uh, thing that Descartes introduced into modern science. Um, the other thing was that things had to be statistically significant to matter. Uh, the other thing that he he said and reinforced, and I think he was trying to um, appease the church at the time, but there's a separation between um, mind and body. And when you look at the specialties in modern medicine today, if you look at the reductionist model of breaking things down into their smallest part, if you look at the things as being statistically significant, or we now refer to it as the randomised control study or the meta-analysis, you can see how uh, a cultural history, Descartes' influence, is still impacting on modern medicine today. So these are all things that Jeremy covers in his book and that have been covered in other books, specifically Yuval Noah Harari and many others in this, in this trying to make an understanding of, of how history has shaped where we are today. And it was so interesting to have Jeremy compare those two explorers and their cultural impact on the world. And of course, then he goes into his second book, The Web of Meaning, where it gets a little more personal. Who am I? Where am I? What am I? How should I live? Why am I and where are we going? And he asks those very important questions. So it was a fascinating, it's, I would recommend both of these books to you. He has his own online course, which I think was, is a very stimulating course all about uh, transformation and how we as individuals need to be involved in that journey. What Charlie Massey refers to as the fifth great cycle being the human social cycle, which we're all part of, and what this podcast, Unstress, is all about, and what our Unstress Health uh, platform is all about, forming a community of like-minded individuals who recognise they're on a journey, want to um, gather together an, a holistic view of human health and planetary health, and, uh, and recognise that that is how we are going to emerge with a better world, a more regener a regenerated world that will be sustainable, not just for our children and our grandchildren, but for many generations to come. So this week's conversation with Jeremy Lent raised all those kind of issues. Um, it was, it, it, the, both the books were very, very stimulating. Uh, the conversation with Jeremy was too. I hope you find it so. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.